All right, I got Kevin Lavelle on the show. He's the founder of Mizzen in Maine, and he's also the co-founder and CEO of Harbor, a better baby monitor and remote nanny platform. Kevin, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, man. Let's let's dive into things. Uh, I'm really excited. I mean, you know, we were talking offline about just your amazing company, Mizzen in Maine, which which I love. It was like one of the. It was was it the first athletic kind of like fitting dress wear for men? I mean, just a fantastic brand. It like act, the clothes look good, but they fit like for athletic fit men. Was it the first one to kind of disrupt that market? Yeah, so we we took uh, performance fabrics and made a traditional dress shirt. Uh, and you know, f for the for the folks watching, you can see my dress shirt stretches. You don't have to iron it or dry clean it. It actually fits better because it stretches. Um, we were the first ones to do it, and we were laughed out of every trade show. Every industry expert told us no one will ever wear this product. And uh, I am uh, I'm happy to say that uh, now it is a ubiquitous product, and basically every menswear brand um, has copied us in some form or fashion. Yeah, I remember, I think it was Kelly Starrett or somebody from CrossFit was doing muscle ups and I'm like, this is legit. <laughs> like the, the, these, everything, again, it looked great, but you could tell it was like that almost like the dry fit. And I mean, that's like dumbing it down. I would never want to compare your quality. No, it's all good. Yeah. I can draw fit, but that's kind of the way I imagine it. It's like, man, that's what, how it looks and feels. It's like it can, it wickers sweat and then, but you look good. So amazing stuff. Yeah, thank you. It was uh, the vision from the very beginning was um, if Ralph Lauren and Nike had a baby, it would be Mizzen and Maine. So kind of classic, timeless style, but then advanced performance fabrics that really drive things forward. And and just very briefly, the the genesis of this, I was an intern in D.C. in college, which taught me I never wanted to work in politics, which was a, a blessing. Um, but in that process, watched a guy who ran into a building soaked in sweat. And I grew up playing golf and watched performance polos take over in the golf course and wondered why had no one ever made a dress shirt out of that type of fabric. Obviously, you know, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the right thing if it were that super loose drapey fabric. But I I knew, you know, I had compression shorts and I had basketball jerseys and I had running shorts and there were all these different types of fabrics. So maybe there was something that you could find that could look like a traditional dress shirt. And after about a year of tinkering, we launched in 2012 um, with the world's first performance fabric dress shirt. It was, we'll, we'll talk more about it, but it was slow going for the first couple of months and years. Um, we did start to gain some traction in the world of CrossFit, have so many great friends from that ecosystem. And, um, and then we really started to take off and it was about 2014, things really started to, to pick up. Yeah, that's probably when I heard you guys on Tim Ferriss and, and the rest is history, as they say. So you disrupted one market. Now I'm excited to talk about a new passion project of yours. You're disrupting the baby monitor market, which yeah. I know as a parent with a 10-year-old and a 6-year-old, I went through that. I had a crappy monitor that like <laughs> – it was just junky, man. It was it was it it would go out all the time and all these things. So when I, when I saw what you were doing, I'm like, man, this is so interesting – and I think one of the things that you've highlighted is nothing has changed. And I was asking you, like, has anything changed in the last, you know, 10 years since my first son was born? And you're like, no. So talk to us about why there has been no change and why you have found a new thing to disrupt. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, just just like with Mizzen and Maine, this was born out of a personal experience and um, the the. Existing solutions for parents are, are terrible. Uh, they're low quality. They're not necessarily secure. Uh, latency and reliability is a big issue. You know, things that crash. And this is one of the most difficult and overwhelming times that people will face in their entire lives. You're going for months, sometimes years, depending on how many kids you have and how well things go. Without good sleep, your health is affected. Typically, marriages are affected. It's really hard to show up and be a great parent every day when you're just running on fumes for weeks and months and sometimes years on end. And so uh, when I when I started, when we found out um, we were having our son, we went through this interesting process where everyone told us, you got to get this stroller, you got to get this car seat, you know, the baby Brez is the most amazing thing ever. And um, so many recommendations and no one said, this is the best baby monitor. So I did a bunch of research and at the time, the leading product on the, the market, um, based on what I could find in terms of getting the most press and reviews. So they had a good publicist team, uh, is a company called Nanit and Nanit is a Wi-Fi camera that runs an app on your phone. And I thought, oh, cool app on my phone. Like, just like my ring doorbell, how convenient. Uh, but a couple weeks in, I woke up one morning and the app had crashed. So you've got to sleep with your phone next to you, which is terrible for a whole host of reasons. But I woke up one morning and I couldn't hear the audio and I rolled over and I looked at it 
and uh, the app had crashed. So I ran upstairs. Of course, he was fine. Kids are more resilient than we give them credit for as nervous parents, especially first time parents. But just an unbelievably alarming experience because you you rely on this thing from a security perspective. Uh, and so I did a little bit of research and learned very quickly that, oh, apps on phones aren't baby monitors. Nanit and all these other companies are very proud to advertise themselves as a baby monitor, but it, it's not. It's a security camera. It's a Wi-Fi camera with an app on your phone. Um, and look, there are convenience factors to having an app on your phone, but it's not a baby monitor. So we went out and bought one of those old school cameras and old school monitors, little teeny screens that everybody's very familiar with. Really low quality. The screen's about this big. If you're trying to watch That's one, even two kids. Yeah, there, it's 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 a terrible experience. And um, once we had our second child, you know, the audio can only cycle back and forth on those devices. So you're getting this odd cacophony of white noise and the random cry. It cries for two seconds, no crying. It cries for two seconds, no crying. Um, across our two kids, I think we bought four of those Motorola devices because they just broke all the time. Uh, if you want to travel, you have to have one of those old school devices because you can't travel with a Wi-Fi camera because you can't tap into a hotel and off another Wi-Fi. And I just, you know, having disrupted one market with Mizzen and Maine, I was just shocked at how terrible the options were for parents because 3.6 million kids are born in the United States every single year. Now, unfortunately, that's declining. and We can talk about how we need to reverse that. But um, there's just this never ending onslaught of new kids that need monitors. Uh, and so I, I have my theories as to why the market has been ignored. And now having built this product, I understand it's a really difficult endeavor. Um, but I, I have wanted to fix this problem for, you know, my son is seven and a half, seven and a half years. And so what we've built is a camera and a monitor that connect directly to each other without internet. And both devices also connect to the cloud. There is nothing like that that exists today. So what you get is a dedicated fail safe local monitor that doesn't rely on the internet. So if your internet goes down or if your router has a glitch, you will stay connected. And if there's any disconnection, you're gonna get an alert telling you, hey, I'm no longer connected, like a power outage. So if there's a power outage, your camera's no longer connected, you're gonna get an alert. Um, and but Kevin, then you is that also, through Bluetooth, yeah. I'm assuming? So the camera creates its own Wi-Fi signal to communicate directly with the monitor. Uh, oh. And so you, you leverage the longer distance of Wi-Fi but it's its own Wi-Fi network. And so if you're at home, it's going to leverage your home Wi-Fi network. But if it's not working, it's going to create its own connection directly to the monitor. And that's that's, that's a account. real game changer for a whole host of reasons. But then you also, with the system, get the benefit of remote access. So you do get an app because if you have a nanny, if you have a babysitter, if you want to check in on them, you know, you're out to dinner. It's really nice to be able to have the benefits of Wi-Fi. You can record, you can rewind. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about the, the specifics, but the, the last kind of critical differentiator is we've created something called smart audio, where it can filter out noise that you don't need to hear if you want to enable that feature. So first time parent, you know, very young child, you, you need to hear everything. But my friends with two, three, four kids, when their kids are, you know, one, two, three, four years old, you need to hear almost nothing, right? They'll talk to themselves. They'll say, mama, I want some water in the middle of the night. And you don't need to hear that. But if you're in a deep sleep or a REM sleep cycle at 3 a.m. and your kid starts talking to you just because they want some water, then you've got a problem. You're awake and you may not go back to sleep. And so we've been able to feature that allows you to filter out everything that you don't want to. Um, and you can train it over time because importantly, we've put an AI chip and a memory chip in the camera itself. So all of the AI processing, all of the noise detection, everything is done at the edge. It's not routing through our servers. So for, very important from a security perspective. And then there's a memory chip in there. So all of your memories are stored on your device locally. Also really important from a security perspective because all of these other Wi-Fi companies, they're routing all of your footage through their servers, sometimes, sometimes questionable location and security, and then back to your app on your phone. And we chose to forego that entirely. And um, we've seen just a very positive response to that approach overall. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. I love the idea of just the, they're both connected on their own Wi-Fi. Like that's mm -hmm. an ingenious solution. And like people should have been doing this obviously a long time ago. Thank God you, you did it. Smart audio. I'm curious. Uh, have you ever seen it backfire though? Where like a parent's like, oh no, like I... I wanted to teach the AI to not hear this, but then I miss something else. Has that ever come out or it's that intelligent that it, it's able to decipher between those? So it's, that, you know? 
it's it's early days and right now what we're doing is it's more time and intensity based so like uh, one or two seconds so if your child you know sneezes you can avoid hearing that but if they're screaming at you you're going to hear it um, and so over time, it will get a lot, a lot, a lot better, and everyone will benefit from the advancements in that. Um, but it's it's much more of like the short durations of time that um, are the things that you really don't need to hear. If something's wrong, they're going to be screaming, and you're going to hear it. Um, yeah. And the reality is, with you know the apps on the phones, those things go out all the time. There's latency issues, the app crashes, and so if you um, in terms of reliability, if you're concerned, this is going to be a significantly more reliable device. Yeah. And then also on that AI piece, what if you have multiple kids? So the thing that it's picking up, will the AI change or can you start it all over? If I have a second kid and he makes different noises than the first kid, are you able to kind of restart, I guess, the AI for that kid? Yeah, absolutely. You can customize it to each individual camera in terms of the things that you're interested in either hearing or not hearing. Yeah, very cool. What uh, what else did you find throughout your process? You mentioned a big one. Obviously, it's just the technology, the crashing, the audio, the cacophony of white noise, which I remember. Yeah. Also, they typically break. Like you said, you bought four of them. I remember ours constantly breaking. And um, and I just, yeah, and I and it was a middle of the, it was like a middle uh, of the run kind of product. It wasn't the best, but it also wasn't the worst. And so it's like, yeah. come on, man, like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. So we know those are all major issues that most parents are facing. What else did you find from your research that parents were complaining about as well that maybe even surprised you? You're like, man, I didn't, I didn't know that that's included that harbors solvent. So one of the, the most critical distinctions between the, the kind of most popular products on the market today and Harbor is we are not going down the baby biometric tracking uh, route. And so what that means is, uh, so Owlet was really one of the pioneers in the space. Uh, Nanit followed suit with their own version. Miku has um, computer vision side. Uh, Massimo is introducing another one. They're all talking about uh, basically strapping a device to your child and telling you whether or not they're breathing. And from a wouldn't it be great if that were true perspective, sure. If you could know unequivocally with hospital grade right uh, devices, if your child uh, has an incident, then, then yes, that would be amazing. But the problem is none of these devices have undergone independent clinical testing. None of them are approved by the FDA. And indeed the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is one of the most risk averse organizations in the world, says don't use these devices because there's no proof that they work that you should use them importantly it ends up relaxing parents adherence to safe sleep guidelines because they go well i've got something strapped to them i'm going to know if something is wrong so the thing that you need to do as a parent is follow safe sleep guidelines firm mattress tight fitting crib sheet nothing else in the crib appropriate fitting pajamas appropriate temperature like the basics if you do that then you've done everything that you possibly can to keep your child safe. Um, the horrific reality of SIDS is it's one of the most um, uh, unimaginable tragedies that a family could ever face. But today, scientists don't know why it happens. And so there is no way to detect that it is happening. And ultimately, these devices... Uh, I'm, I'm wearing a whoop and I will say a whoop is interesting. Like I track it over time. I'm interested in my biometrics as a human looking to better understand, you know, heart rate variability and sleep and all of that. It's interesting information. It is not medical information. And when it comes to strapping a device to your child, it should be something that you know unequivocally works and they just haven't been able to prove it in any way. And that's a really important um, distinction because if it worked, great, you should use it if you want to use it, but we don't know that it does. And so the end result of this, and I, I give all of that background to say, we will not use these devices because they have not been proven to work. The American Academy of Pediatrics advises against it. And the end result is, and I've seen it from most parents that I know that use it, is an increasingly uh, just overwhelming amount of anxiety because they'll go, I just feel so much more relaxed because I can just check their heart rate at any time. I'm checking it three times, five times, six times a night. I'm like, but you're not meant to do that. And ultimately, if you followed all the safe sleep guidelines and you're taking care of them, then 
you've done everything that you need to as a parent and you're getting all of this additional information, which is not accurate, not correct, not reliable. And, you know, so many parents I know, they're like after the third time, second or third time of a false alert that tells me my child's not breathing, I just had to throw the device away. Because like, you can only get that alert that your child is not breathing so many times before you just go, I just can't handle it anymore. But now you've got that increased anxiety, which is completely understandable. It's the most nerve wracking time of your life. You bring, I, I joke all the time, like when they let us leave the hospital, my son was, I think two days old. It was like, you're letting us go? Like, how could you possibly let us walk out of here with this child? I don't know we have I'm no idea what we're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, but that's what we've done, uh, well, since the invention of hospitals. So anyway, the, the most important thing uh, in terms of the kind of lessons learned going through all of this is um, it's, not, it's not science that is backed by independent clinical testing, and uh, it's the wrong decision um, for Harbor to try and just prey on that fear-based marketing that so many of these other companies have been doing. Yeah, that's great. And I, I really can't imagine. I mean, I love all the biometrics. I've had aura rings, a bio strap. It yeah. makes complete sense. But putting on a product on a child, and we know uh, we, there's plenty of evidence, and I, I don't know what the what it's made of, but I wouldn't want to put anything with Wi-Fi or anything on my child. We know some of the electromagnetic magnetic pollution, it's already bad. And so putting something directly on them, I don't know what it uses, but I, I wouldn't really be comfortable on that. And yeah, I know. I know. Also, just putting something on a child can be very difficult. Like just getting them their clothes on and a diaper could be difficult. Let alone another device. And to yeah. your point with the anxiety, I remember I would. I used to have my kid. He would just nap on me for two hours in a chair. And so, mm -hmm. talk about anxiety. I, like I, I was a first time. That was my first kid, and so I was doing all the make mistakes yeah. first time parents make. I don't want him to cry. <laughs> Make sure he naps for two hours. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so more anxiety provoking. I, I can't imagine. Um, talk to that piece on anxiety though. Cause I know that's a, a big, a big part of what, what you talk about is that, you know, you had mentioned earlier that we are already in an anxiety provoked generation, right? Yeah. And we're seeing that with less, less, uh, kids being born. The, the birth rate has declined mm -hmm. dramatically. I have a whole bunch of reasons of my own. I think um, we're looking at a toxicity generation, looking at glyphosate, plastics, and parabens. Um, we're seeing a lot of issues with IVF, and, and I think that all has to do with a lot of hormones. Uh, Dr. Shauna Swan talks about it in her book, Countdown. There's, there's plenty of other people out there too. Yeah. And you know, it, it's an interesting topic that you're bringing up anxiety because I just finished reading Jonathan Haidt's book, The Anxiety Generation. He's talking about why the cell phone and social media mm -hmm. since 2012, we've seen the peak mm -hmm. of it. We've seen, we, we are rewiring our kids' brains and now you're yeah. seeing more and more fragile kids than ever. What are, and, and how, how do you see this? And it, how can Harbor at all help with some of this anxiety provoke that we're already got, right? So we need to lessen yeah. the load. Where, where yeah. are you seeing that or what advice would you give uh, to, to parents right now? I mean, any parent uh, with, well, really any parent, I would just so strongly suggest reading Hyde's book, um, Anxious Generation. Is, all of his books, I think, are exceptional. Uh, I've been a fan of his work for a long time. Um, and there are reasonable disagreements about individual recommendations, sure. But the overarching takeaways are, are very, very real. Um, you know, health crisis aside and, you know, the, our food supply, all of those things aside in terms of fertility, ultimately, if we can make it easier to have kids, then that is a win for communities, for society, for humanity. Uh, and unfortunately, the birth rate in America is declining. And that is not a good thing. Um, the alarmists that say we have too many people on the planet and I'm, I'm not going to have children because of the environment. Um, I, I can't, I can't have uh, a productive discussion with those folks in terms of why they're wrong. They have their own opinions, but if we can, uh, fix the perception that having a kid will be the most, um, you know, exhausting, difficult, it's just, you know, too hard. It's too hard. I think a lot of people are are waiting a long time until everything is right in their lives. And, you know, you're a parent, there's, there's no right time. Uh, the time to have your kids is when, when you have them. Um, but if we can make it easier and less anxiety inducing and less exhausting to have kids, um, we can help change the narrative. And that's a big, big lofty goal. 
Uh, and, you know, I, I, I chuckle sometimes when I say that because, you know, the show Silicon Valley, when they when they joked about, you know, making the world a better place, one API at a time um, to, to claim that we're going to help reverse the birth uh, birth rate decline in the United States is is perhaps a little grandiose. But every family where we make it easier to have kids, we can help change the narrative. And, and indeed, we'll talk a little bit about our remote night nanny. Parents who have used our remote night nanny, which helps with developing healthy sleep habits for parents and kids alike, um, helps parents get more sleep. We have heard from some of our pilot families that we gave them hope to have another child. Uh, one of our moms, she's like, this is my second kid. I work in the medical field. I, ha I thought I had it all figured out, but working with you overnight for the, the duration of time that we did, you just gave me, you literally gave me hope to have another child, right? My, my, their son was, I think, three or four months old. And within a week, we had made a serious impact on his ability to get more consistent, longer sleep. And of course, helping the parents sleep. Um, every parent that we can help with that, uh, we think we can make a really positive impact. And, you know, anxiety, there's lots of drivers and factors and all of those things. But I'll tell you one thing, if you're not sleeping, it's really hard to reduce stress and anxiety. The minute you start sleeping, you know, I think it's less than six hours a night, everything starts to go in the wrong direction. Your, you know, your resting heart rate, your heart rate variability, your cognition, your judgment, your patience, everything is strained. Uh, and so if we can help parents sleep more, I think we can help make certainly the broader impact, but certainly healthy, healthier families. Um, uh, I know the nights where I don't get good sleep, it's a lot harder to be a patient spouse and a patient husband a pa uh, and, and a patient uh, father. Uh, so that, that would be one of the biggest things I would say in that direction. Yeah, I love I love what you said. And I would I, I think having your first kid, you don't know what you know. And then when you once you once you go over that that hump, OK, I can have a second kid. But if it can be easier and you know you have the right equipment, the right tools, the right strategies. You're right. That's a huge burden when you think about having multiple kids. It's like, man, I'm going to lose sleep. And that's just going to be one of the many factors. And so if you can demolish that argument, that obstacle, it yeah. will help, I think, I think over time. And I think you're right. You know, it's funny. A couple of things. Uh, I was just thinking. I read this the other day about, you know, King Energy. And I'm a big, uh, you know, fan of being a better father and a better husband. And you'll hear this a lot in like these men's circles, what it means to have king energy. And king mm -hmm. energy, the whole idea is that you embody the best of the masculine and the feminine, which means mm -hmm. you can be a leader, you can be stern, but you can also be compassionate, loving, and empathetic. Yes. And like that duality is very, um, that's the best. That's like really the best. And so you'll hear that a lot, king energy. Well, guess what? King energy, one of the big facets of someone that has king energy, energy is someone that number one is uh, fertile and appreciates. And so when you learn about this idea of fertility, literally meaning have more, more kids. So there you go, guys. If you want to have king energy, if you look <laughs> at all the kings out there and some of the wealthiest yeah. people in the world, even like Elon Musk, I think has multiple, multiple kids. And I'm not saying that that makes him great. I'm just saying if you look <laughs> at a lot of the leaders and the people that have done a lot, you, you see that they had a lot of kids. They had king energy. So there you go. You guys are disrupting the market. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I think the, the other thing I would say, kind of tying together this notion of anxiety, um, one of the things I've really appreciated from, from Height's work in, the most recent, in his most recent book is, he you know, says, we've overprotected kids in the real world and underprotected them online. Pushing the online aside for a second, I see, I, I live in a very safe neighborhood and I see in conversations with parents a almost complete unwillingness to let their children be outside unsupervised. And I'm not talking about a two-year-old, um, but kids that are five, six, seven, eight, nine years old. And uh, I think almost universally, if you talk to people in their kind of late 30s through 50s, once you were five or six years old, you were outside for like the day. You know, it was... Um, parents were like, go outside, go play, go find a neighbor's house, go find a whatever. And that, that lack of, of play and freedom is having a, a very serious impact on children long-term, but also on the stress level of parents. If you can't let your kids just go be, then you have even less time to be yourself. If you're worried about them all the time in, in, in such an overwhelming way, and that 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 impacts and influences your overall well-being 
what we're seeing at Harbor and part of the, the narrative change that I hope to be a part of is I think that's starting all the way back from when we were bringing kids home from the hospital. And again, I admit it, I was very anxious and nervous when I came home, of course. But we are um, some of the, and, and I think some of these companies that sell these baby biometrics, they um, create this uh, overwhelming sense of anxiety because they can sell products. Um, but the narrative is is having these long stream, long term implications. And, you know, kids, you'll hear experts, uh, experts and social media influencers that will basically talk about how you're, you know, you're never supposed, never supposed to let your child cry. And that's just not true. And And that that mentality from the earliest age is carrying through to, I can't let my children play outside, is carrying through to kids are scared to go apply for jobs. They're scared to go get a driver's license. Uh, I saw, I think it was something like 19% of kids um, applying for their first job brought their parent um, in the last year. I don't remember where I saw that, but it was so overwhelmingly absurd. And it's because we don't, as parents, we're not allowing children, we don't believe in them as capable beings. Now, a baby clearly needs your full tender loving care and supervision. They literally can't survive without you. But the idea that they can't cry for even 10 seconds without you holding their hand and you know letting them know that you hear them, that is not helping children. You are not helping them set up for success and you're not helping your own anxiety as a parent. Yeah. So, so, so good. And it was funny. I was talking to Ryan Muncy the other day, who's the author of uh, fuck your feelings. And I asked him <laughs> a similar question to, to your point. I said, Hey, Ryan, you know, uh, I love, I love all the worlds. I love learning about mindful parenting. Uh, I don't want to call it gentle parenting, mindful, mindful parenting. Um, but I also, there's that duality, right? Like the King energy, there's the duality of like, but we also need to be stern and set standards. And I said, how do you see that? Because we know, and his book talks all about this, the neuroscience that feelings are basically, they're transient and they are a very bad proxy for making yes. decisions. And, yes. but we <clears throat> identify that as them and we just like, Oh, I feel anxious. I feel depressed. So I'm going to go down this route. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's not even real. It's like a moment in reality that you've now made your identity. So like, stop yes. using that. At yes. the same time, you've got the mindful parenting experts, some of them saying, Hey, you know, label that emotion and feel that thing for your kid. So I said, Ryan, how do you look at that? How do you, how do you, how do you live in that duality? And he said, Joel, it's a great point. And listen, he said, I'll just say this. I've never seen I've never met any of these people, the mindful kids, the mindful parenting kids. I've never seen them be a CEO of a company. I've never seen them disrupt an industry. I've never seen them lead, you know, men, people, women, whatever. So, you know, in theory, it makes a lot of great sense, but I've never seen them be millionaires, billionaires. And again, that's not what we're saying. Like, though, they should be rich. We're just looking at it. Like the most successful people, they weren't coddled. Okay. So that, that was the yeah, point. Yeah. And, and there's been a, a, thankfully a resurgent focus on the idea that you have to encounter some level of adversity and height talks a lot about this in order to do anything. If you want to win a race, if you want to get a good grade on a test, adversity is literally just some form of struggle. And so much of today's parenting and the reality is, and, and I think gentle parenting sometimes gets a little bit twisted, but yeah, Generally, in, in the realm of gentle parenting, it's like, I need to make sure that you are in touch with your emotions all the time. And I need to, I need to affirm, it doesn't necessarily mean and, and uh, proponents of gentle parenting will try and push back and say, we're not saying let your kid get away with everything. And I understand that. But affirming every emotion and sitting in it is not healthy. Abigail Schreier's bad therapy, I mean, just an absolute banger in terms of like every single page in every chapter is like, thank you. Someone has finally put words to this. It doesn't mean that we should pretend emotions aren't real. And as fathers, we should negate the things that our kids feel because everyone should just shut up and get, no, like you can talk to your kids and you can build deep, meaningful bonds with them, but we don't also have to ask them, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? Are you sad? Are you sad? Are you sad? Because as it turns out, if you ask people if they're sad all the time, they're going to say yes. And so um, I see this all, I'm really passionate about this. I see it as all connected because ultimately um, we need to 
as parents empower our children and believe in their capabilities. Um, there are lots of different ways to do that, but I see this tied all the way back through to when parents don't allow their kids to learn and struggle through some basic adversity of literally learning how to sleep because it's a skill. You have to learn how to sleep. Um, then they set the child up for health issues. They set themselves up for health issues because they're not sleeping for longer. One of the experts that we talked to, uh, she's a pediatric sleep doctor, um, Anessa Donskoy, she had the best example of this. I, I, I was asking her, how do you communicate with parents who really struggle with this idea of I can't let my child cry in any way during sleep? Again, we'll, we'll, there's always the extreme. That doesn't mean shut them in their room and let them cry for 12 straight hours but you don't need to immediately be there. She said, if you teach your child how to ride a bike, they're going to fall. And the next day, if you go into your work or you're talking to somebody and they're like, oh, tell me about what happened. You wouldn't say, well, I, I let my child cry for a long time. You would say, I help them learn how to ride a bike. Of course they're gonna fall down and of course they're gonna cry. But you also, it's part of learning and it's part of adversity and it's part of some level of struggle. And so with the ability to develop those healthy sleep habits, parents have run away from this idea that it's okay for them to cry a little bit and struggle a little bit. Um, and it's having real implications on just family's health, children's health. Uh, the sooner that a child sleeps, the better their mental cognition, the better their overall dysregulation, the better their uh, brain development, the earlier you get a child to sleep, the healthier they are. And the earlier you as a family can start sleeping through the night again, the healthier you'll be as a family as well. Dude, couldn't agree more. I love also tying it back to some of the features at Harbor and going back to even that anxiety piece. You nailed it. I think uh, Matthew Walker talks about in his book, mm -hmm. I think it's like five and a half hours. We start to see multiple days of that. And I know as a first responder, I was very happy yeah. to get five hours of sleep if I could get six or five, I was fine. And if anything below five, I felt it, it would start to pile on me. And we know that, like you said, the prefrontal cortex, the executive decision-making of your brain shuts down. You stop making good decisions. You're more reactive. You start to have more cravings. Leptin and ghrelin levels go out of control. You start overeating. Mm -hmm. So if your sleep is not dialed in, we got a problem. So talk to me about the remote uh, nanny features that you guys uh, implement and how is that kind of helping with parents? So um, in-home night nannies or night nurses can be one of the greatest blessings in life because you have an expert, they come into your house for typically six, eight, 12 weeks, whether it's every night or every other night. And as a parent, and I'm describing this for, for folks who may not be familiar with this, but as a parent, you hand the night nurse or night nanny your baby monitor, and that night nanny will stay in a guest room, they'll stay on your couch, you know, somewhere in your house. And they will sleep, they'll, they'll be in your house and they'll sleep, but they will listen. And if your child starts to cry, they have experience and expertise in children's cries and they're kind of, they'll find a rhythm, they'll listen. And if it, it warrants sort of like, okay, I need to check in on that, they'll look, child's fine, nothing's wrong. Okay, I'm gonna use a round number here, four or five month old child. You can allow them to kind of fuss or cry or struggle for about 10 or 15 minutes before you go in. So they'll start a timer, timer will go up, if it's five minutes and they stop, well, cancel the timer. A minute later, they start crying again, start the timer again. It's a lot of work to learn those healthy sleep habits. And as a parent, the thing you struggle with is your child starts to cry. It's a really difficult urge not to just run in there and immediately address whatever they might need. But a professional is like, no, that kid's fine. I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait it out. I'm going to wait a few more minutes. And it doesn't mean let them cry all night long, but but it follow a routine because ultimately what an in-home night nanny or an in-home night nurse or some sort of sleep expert is helping your child do is learn how to fall back asleep. Because when a child wakes up in the middle of the night, they're going to immediately go, oh my gosh, you know, panic. I got it. I need help. I need something. But they have to learn, okay, no, it's nighttime. I'm supposed to go back to sleep and circadian rhythms and children are exceptionally capable of this despite everything that we believe. And so what an in-home night nanny does is they handle that burden and it is a burden, but it's a blessing. <laughs> it's, it's a challenge. They handle that all night long. And if um, the mom is breastfeeding and it's time to feed because of the schedule, they'll bring the baby to mom, mom can nurse, and then they will bring the baby, burp them, change them and put them back down. And so as parents, you can get 
almost a full night's sleep, depending on whether you're nursing or not. But you can get almost a full night's sleep. The challenge of that is in a city like Dallas, where I'm from, you're talking three to four hundred dollars a night. New York or L.A., you're talking seven hundred or more if you can even find one. And in a lot of the country, smaller towns and, and even mid-sized towns, you may just literally not be able to find somebody. And in all of my research and in, in interviewing a lot of parents, many of whom could easily afford an in-home night nurse full time, he said, I didn't want someone else in my house. I didn't want someone else caring for my child. So there's a range of opinions and perspectives on that. But ultimately, it's about an expert whose only job is to help your child learn how to sleep and help you get more sleep as a parent. So what we have done is we've recreated many of those benefits at scale at about 90% less expensive, 90 to 95% less expensive than that in-home. So when you have a Harbor camera and monitor and you want to hire us as a remote night nanny, you can turn over controls of your camera and your monitor to our professionally trained night nurses. They have uh, they are registered nurses. They have um, significant experience in pediatrics, and many of them have spent a long time as night nurses. What we do is we turn the volume of your monitor all the way down to zero remotely, and we only turn it up when it's time for you to go in and take action with your child. So if something is wrong, or if any of those thresholds are reached, so let's say that you know 10 minute or 15 minute threshold is reached. And so what, what happens is, and we've done this with about two dozen families so far. Night one is a little bit awkward. Parents are like, ah, this is different. I'm not sure about this. Night two, they sleep better than they have in, you know, maybe even a year because they know I've got a professional watching. And if I'm needed as a parent, I'm the caregiver, I can go in and care for my child and I will be told. And importantly, from a security and a reliability perspective, because we've built the hardware, the software and the firmware, if the camera or monitor, if we lose connection to the camera or monitor, the monitor in your room is just going to turn back on. It's going to say, hey, I can't talk to Harbor. I've lost connection. So my job is to alert the parent that no, no one is, is watching or supporting. And then it's just a normal night that the parent would have the baby monitor in their room. So we've done, again, about two dozen of these. The results have been amazing and life-changing for the parents. And our long-term vision is to get the cost of this down to about $20 a night. So that means you could get three months of all night care for about the price of one in-home week of a night nurse. And so our vision here is we can democratize access to sleep expertise because most parents can't afford or don't want that experience. But we can say you're the one who takes care of your child. And that is a really big deal. Yeah, that's that's really neat. So and could people if like, man, I, I know I got a big week coming up. Can I just do it for like one week and then not pay and then like turn off the subscription and then turn it back on that kind of thing? You know, knowing that I need to like really be prepared for like a certain week or something. Yeah, so our focus is going to be on kids who are in that phase of learning how to sleep. And that tends to be about two to eight months old, depending on the family and the circumstances. And um, we we are. So, so broader context, we have just launched our pre-sales. Our first customers here in June 2024 have just started to get their product, and we are rolling this out over the course of the summer into the fall. Um, our, our approach will end up being to sell weeks and months of the remote night nanny. So you can buy a week, um, and then ultimately we will try and coach parents into if you want to do it, you have to do it for a block of time. So if you want just, oh, I just need help for one night, then we're really not going to be that helpful because you need some level of repetition. Uh, but it's ultimately about your uh, your schedule and your desire to participate as a parent. Uh, if you want the Harbor camera and monitor and never want to touch remote night nanny, then you don't have to. It's, it's totally an opt-in. Uh, and importantly, from a security perspective, unless you opt in and you grant us access, we can never see your camera, your footage, or your monitor. Yeah, very cool. And so the big difference between the smart audio, because I'm, assume, I'm assuming the smart audio could nullify sounds and also increase sounds so that I hear it. But the big difference is I know that I have an actual human, a trained human, watching my child. And that's like yes. the added bonus than just using smart audio, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Smart audio is included in the camera and monitor. And we're talking about like one, two, three, four seconds of, of filtering. We're not mm -hmm. smart audio won't take you through 10 minutes of noise filtering. 
Um, but the remote night nanny is really for that developmental sleep phase that you're trying to help the child learn how to sleep, where you've got a real live professional, a nurse, eyes on glass, and the ability to help you really coach you through that experience. Yeah, that's really cool. And I remember in my own personal life that I, I would say every three months, and it's probably just from the evolution of my child as they're growing, all of a sudden I'd get into a routine with them and then they would all of a sudden change Sleep the, way progressions, they yeah. the way they Yeah. So it would actually be, I think, neat for parents to maybe at the maybe quarterly do a week or two weeks and get that rhythm in. And then they maybe once they find the rhythm, now they're good. So even something like that, I think that could be really, really helpful. So that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, and I wanted to kind of switch gears here, but I don't know if, if there's anything else that we missed. So let me know. But I, I did want to switch gears and ask like, how has it been to me? It seems like this is an amazing product. It's disrupting the market. Like everybody should be raising their hand this. Yes, uh, I want one yeah. of these, but how has it been with the actual launching and actually the startup space? How has it been easy or has it been a little bit challenging? <laughs> so, um, getting to do a second startup, um, has been, I feel very fortunate to be, you know, able to pursue this. Um, I feel like, um, you, my my unique gift I learned is uh, I think I can see something that should be and find a way to bring it to life, right? Convince team members, partners, investors, customers that this is worth pursuing. Um, the the devil in the details, all of the the work that goes into it is uh, it's never easy. I've been officially working on launching Harbor for well over two years. My co-founder and I teamed up last uh, in summer of 2022. We started the company in uh, September of 22. So it's been, I mean, nearly two years of development to bring this to life because it's such a complicated product and it is a camera, it's a monitor, uh, it's firmware, it's software, uh, along with the services that we're doing. And so what, uh, what I think has been surprising this time, I didn't raise venture capital for Mizzen and Maine. I raised angel capital. Um, and then ended up getting a growth investment from the world's largest uh, consumer retail private equity firm, Catterton. I hadn't been in the venture world before, and, and going through the venture experience this time has been very eye-opening. Um, I started the process of raising venture capital in late 22, which if any of your listeners have, are familiar with the VC or entrepreneurial landscape, 21 and early 22 was peak mania and just money was flowing. And summer of 22, everything just in, just came to a full dead stop. And unless you were uh, an AI company, it was um, a very, very difficult uh, fundraising environment. And so um, I have been surprised at, I, I'll be blunt and say, I, I expected a lot of these conversations with VCs to be kind of um, somewhat esoteric, you know, let's create the vision, let's, you know, the art of the possible, and um, a lot of VCs um, just completely ghosted. I'd have a great conversation and then they would just never answer another email again. They'd be like, oh, we're gonna go talk to the investment committee. We love it. And then they would just never respond. Um, and, and so, you know, when they say on their website, you know, founders make the world go around and we have all the respect in the world for founders, they couldn't literally just say like, actually we're gonna pass. Um, so, so there was a lot of that. The other thing was um, how many, I'll just be blunt and say like a myopic things that I heard, like we think the go to market's going to be really tough. Like how many, how many things do you invest in where the go to market's easy? And so um, some of these conversations, it, there's, of course, you're going to get 99 or, you know, 199 no's that's, that's the nature of the world. But some of the things that I heard were just really surprising relative to what I thought the conversations with VCs were going to be like. A little different. I would too, say Kevin, this isn't your first rodeo. Like you've actually, no. you have a track record. Like you've proven yeah. yourself to take something from nothing, disrupt it, and like yeah. that's actually like I'd be happy to chat with you. Like, okay, here's a guy <laughs> who's actually done this. This isn't a rookie, you know, with the pie in the sky vision to change the world. He's actually done yeah. this before. Now he's just doing. He's replicating it again. So that, that yeah, is very one surprising. Of the, one of the conversations I had, they said, "Well, we just we're not sure that you're going to be able to figure out how to build a brand here." I was like. Okay. I don't know what else to say to you. Um, cause we'd spent the whole conversation talking about how I built, you know, Mizzen and Maine. And of course it's not the same. It's, it's of course can be a little different, but, um, you know, the, I, I would say the four or five conversations I had where 
yeah, four or five where an investor said, I just don't think it's going to work. Like, I don't think, I understand what you think you're going to do. I don't think it's going to work. I was like, thank you. Like, I appreciate that level of, I think you're wrong. And obviously I'm going to keep going, but I've been amazed at how, um, how few firms are willing to say that. Um, some of the responses I feel like are a little bit silly, but you know, that's the way, that's the nature of these things. That's, that's fundraising. Um, but man, just, I can think of the, you know, I can think of the conversation where they said to me, I just don't think it's going to work. And I just remember thinking like, damn, thank you for your honesty and some measure of courage to just tell me you disagree. Um, so, um, otherwise in terms of kind of going down this road, um, the biggest takeaway from the first time to the second time is you're always in survival mode for the first so many years and you never really feel good for more than a very short period of time. But with the bad, the, the first time around, you know, it felt so apocalyptic um, so many times. We're like, God, are we even going to make it? And now when we have the really tough weeks or months or conversations or things aren't going the way that we want to, it's just kind of like, well, I don't know. This is how it works. Like no one that's ever built a great company was like, God, it was really, it was a really straightforward path. I'm, I'm really pleased at how peaceful and uh, stress-free those five to 10 years of my life were. Yeah, dude, that is such good advice. And you know, you always see some of the great, great leaders out there and they talk about this all the time is that we we face the same things that everybody else faces. The difference is usually from the high performers is their moments. They're not minutes or they're not weeks. They're not months. It's, it's a moment. And I get that moment <laughs> to be pissed off, but I'm going to change course and course correct really quickly. And so that's what I yeah. see is the big difference. And that sounds like what you're talking about. Yeah. And um, having now, read a lot of, you know, whether it's blogs or podcasts and, and listen to so many entrepreneurs that I look up and respect to, you just, all you have to do is find solace and kind of empathy and connection to every journey of every successful founder. Um, one of the greatest books I've read in entrepreneurship in a long time, I think it was called The Founders. Uh, it's about the PayPal story. And the PayPal mafia is sort of this legendary group of founders and so many great companies have been born and investors have been born out of the early years of the PayPal team and they just crushed it. But if you read their story, literally a dozen times they were within one to seven days of just shutting, like imminently shutting down. And I think about some of the names, you know, the, the Peter Thiel's, the Elon Musk's, the Jack Selby's who have come to redefine what it means to be an entrepreneur. And they really, I don't, they didn't specifically build Silicon Valley, but like the startup world that we know today is shaped by these people. And they were a hair's breadth away from anonymity because they would have gone under and they may have had to go get a normal job and they wouldn't have become successful investors and entrepreneurs. And so like the Titans of the startup world were always a hair's breadth away from anonymity and, you know, effectively obsolescence. And, and that I keep coming back to in the moments where I'm like, I don't know that we're going to make it. Yeah, dude. I love, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. That is so good. And, uh, you know, some of my story and I've, I shared with you a little bit offline and yeah. like, you know, practically going bankrupt and having to pull money out of my pension and all that, all those kind of things. And I think like you, you know, what's interesting is it's made me really good at flexing that muscle that I never yes. had to flex before. And so sure. now, even when my back's against the wall, it's a lot easier for me to say, yeah, I'll do that. Or yes, I'm going to take a chance on that. And I don't want to say it like, in a, oh, I'm just taking risks more than the average, but I'm very more, I'm a lot more comfortable than to do that. And I see most people staying in their small window. Cause they're like, Nope, not going to do that. Not going to take a chance. And I'm like, well, do you, but uh, I refuse to be living in my mediocrity for me personally. So, um, yeah, man, thanks for sharing that. That's super impactful. Um, I know you probably got to run, um, any, any, uh, any last, any, anything we didn't cover that you, you wish that we, you wish we should have, or anything that you didn't get a chance to, to say that we, we missed. Um, I'm sure I could, come up with a hundred random things to say, but I would just say, you know, I appreciate your focus on trying to, to help inspire, you know, dads and entrepreneurs and healthier families uh, across the board. We need more voices that this is the thing that they're talking about rather than kind of uh, 
nonstop self-love and influencer marketing and all of that, that nonsense, like talking about how we can build stronger children, healthier marriages, healthier families. Um, the more voices that are talking about it, the better. So appreciate your, your leadership here. Yeah, man. Thank you. Talk to us about where, uh, if people want to go out and see everything that you guys are up to, where are you guys at on social media? How can they connect with you? And then also wh what's the website, the pre-sales already launched, I guess, or can people yeah. still jump on that if they want to? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, our mission at, at Harbor is happier parents and healthier families, one restful night at a time. So if people go to harbor.co, we have a ton of free resources, sleep guides for infants, sleep guides for toddlers. We have a $9 a month, which is just dirt cheap uh, service to speak with infant care specialists uh, on video chat, text, whatever you need, as much as you need, because we see the more we can help parents uh, conquer some of these issues and bring real tactical information that isn't kind of wishy-washy. There's a lot of blogs out there and a lot of influencers that are giving a lot of bad or kind of mealy-mouthed advice. We try and be as straightforward and to the point as possible to help parents in, in a very overwhelming and difficult time. Of course, if they want to sign up and, and uh, buy the Harbor camera and monitor, we would love to have them do that as well, but we've got a lot of great free resources. Um, we are shipping our first units to customers right now. Uh, and then the rest of the units, uh, based on pre-order, kind of uh, how people fall in the pre-order list, uh, will ship later this summer. Um, on all the socials, we are at Harbor Sleep. Uh, that's H-A-R-B-O-R -R Sleep. Uh, I think I forgot to say, our, yeah, our website is harbor.co. And then I'm on X at Kevin S. Lavelle. Uh, and I believe that is also my LinkedIn profile. I, I try and share as much of the journey as I can from there. I got to film some videos yesterday. We uh, our cameras left the distribution center yesterday to ship out to customers. It was a huge day. I actually picked up a bunch of them and hand carried them to a bunch of customers around the DFW area, which was a really kind of magical experience and shared some videos and some thoughts from that journey. So cool, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing that journey. Kevin Lavelle from Harbor Sleep. Thanks for being on the show, brother. Appreciate you. Thank you, Joel.